All right, I'm just gonna get this out of the way. Here are the presets that I use on my GoPro when flying FPV. Feel free to pause the video, copy these, and try them out yourself. And if that's all you came for, then cool, you're all set. You can probably turn off the video now. But there was one of you in one of my recent videos that caught my attention asking if I could do a full FPV-centered GoPro tutorial, explaining not only what my settings are, but why I've chosen them. Specifically, Alicia asked for a video that could help even those of you with zero camera knowledge, who might have never used manual settings on a camera before, so that's what I'm going to attempt to do. I've decided to start right at the beginning and explain the significance of a few camera basics first, specifically resolution, shutter speed, frame rate, and ISO. Uh, if you already know all that and you just want to skip ahead, feel free to jump to here, but I do think that understanding these four basics first is really critical. I also think this might be one of the hardest videos I've made to date. So if any of you guys find this helpful, just giving this video a like and possibly subscribing would really help a lot. But anyways, let's get into it. These are the resolutions available on the GoPro Hero 10. And for the most part, the choice is simple. The higher the resolution, the more detail or quality you will have in your image. Here's an example of a clip in 4K resolution. Now here's another in 2.7K, one in 1080p, and one in 720p. Now, 720p looks great when you're watching it on a small screen, like on your phone, but if you stretch it out onto a bigger screen, it starts to look pixelated. However, each GoPro will have some limitations for the options that are available at its highest resolution. As you can see, if I set my new Hero 10 to 5 or 5.3K, which is the highest resolution possible, it can film a maximum of 60 frames per second, and the widest camera angle available is wide. If I lower that resolution to 4K though, I can now shoot up to 120 frames per second, and I get an even wider option called Super View. So depending on what you're shooting and what your preferences are, there are times where you'll have to sacrifice resolution in order to shoot at a higher frame rate or with a wider lens. Now, the other thing you wanna make sure of when choosing a higher resolution is that your computer is powerful enough to handle it. The more detail your image has, the tougher it'll be for computer to process it. And it might make it easier for you to use 4K, 2.7K, or maybe 1080p because of your computer's limitations. So before you go out and film your epic footage, maybe do a test run first and make sure that you'll be able to work with it after. A bigger resolution is always better, but if you can't work with it afterwards, then what's the point? So next, what's the significance of frame rate? Well, a video is essentially a series of still frames that are played back quickly to create a moving image. The frame rate determines how many of these frames will play back per each second in your video. If a video had an extremely low frame rate, it would probably look really choppy and would resemble more of a PowerPoint presentation. The more frames you add into each second of that video, the more your movement will start to look fluid and realistic. Now, this example was a bit exaggerated, and GoPros won't actually let us shoot at extremely low frame rates, but you will still notice that the higher frame rate you choose, the more realistic your footage will look. Now, this isn't always a good thing though, and just because something is more realistic doesn't mean it's more cinematic. In Hollywood films, around 24 frames per second is often considered the most cinematic frame rate. And most movies that you've seen are shot at either 24 or 25 FPS, depending on the region. For most situations, 24 frames per second provides a nice balance of clarity while still not completely looking like real life. It's a subtle difference, but it's one of the elements that give movies that magical film look, instead of looking cheap like a soap opera or a home video. One exception to this would be during extremely quick action scenes, where at 24 frames per second, things can seem too blurry, and it starts to become difficult to keep track of what's going on. Now, due to how quickly FPV drones can fly, I would say that they sometimes fall under this category as well, which is why the most common frame rate that I see most people flying at is 30 frames per second. This isn't to say that it's impossible to fly at 24 frames per second, but if you do any quick movements or uh, there are vibrations in your drone, they'll be much more obvious and will result in a blurry image. 30 FPS gives a little bit more room for error and is easier to follow. Pro tip, if you ever wanna see what frame rate someone's YouTube video is filmed at, it's actually really simple. All you have to do is right click on the video and then click on stats for nerds. 
Then on the third line down, they give you the full resolution and the frame rate. I use this all the time, and I think this trick is pretty useful. Next, we have shutter speed. And the shutter speed works directly with your frame rate and it determines how long your camera takes to capture each frame of your video. This influences two things, how much light is able to enter the camera and how much motion blur you might see in your image. A low or a slow shutter speed will let in more light, but it also will struggle to keep up with any movement, so it might result in some motion blur. A higher shutter speed will capture each frame more quickly and will create less motion blur, but will also let in less light. Now, our eyes actually prefer a little bit of motion blur because although it's not something we actively think about, it is more similar to what we see in real life. And you can test this really easily by waving your hand in front of your face. Now, if you're in public, you might look crazy, but you should try it. If you wave your hand slowly, it's really easy to keep up with the movement, but the faster you wave it, the harder it is to keep up and the more blurry your hand gets. We often try to recreate this effect in our cameras. And to do this, we usually wanna make sure that our frame rate and shutter speed are working together and are following what is called the 180 rule. The 180 degree rule states that for the most pleasing image, you ideally wanna have a shutter speed that is one over double your frame rate in order for the two elements to complement each other well and create natural looking motion blur. If we look back at my presets, you can see that whenever I shoot at 30 frames per second, the shutter is set to one over 60, while whenever I shoot at 60 frames per second, the shutter is set to one over 120. If the shutter is set too high or too low, the movement in the image can start to look a little bit choppy and weird and the motion blur seems less natural. Now, by default, your GoPro will have the shutter speed set to auto. It doesn't really care that much about having perfect motion blur and prioritizes making sure that your image is always properly exposed by controlling the amount of light that enters the camera. And it does this by increasing the shutter speed as necessary. This can be very helpful and convenient, but in that case, you will sometimes miss out on having that pleasing motion blur. Finally, there is ISO. And this one is pretty simple. Your ISO will essentially give you a digital boost of exposure or brightness to your image. Especially if you're locking your shutter speed in place, if you're shooting in a very dark location, you can raise your ISO and it will add brightness back into your video. However, there's a catch. And the more you raise your ISO, the more of this digital grain will also be added to your video, steadily lowering its quality. Therefore, it's okay to raise your ISO as needed because you wanna be able to see what you're shooting, but the goal should always be to keep your ISO as low as possible. Okay, so I hope that made sense and I hope that it was easy enough to follow, but now the part that you actually came for. How can you apply all these things to get the best possible settings and how do they influence the choices that I made on mine? To explain this, I'm gonna go over my cinematic preset and go over each setting one by one and I'll try to add any tips or insights that I might have along the way. Okay, for my cinematic preset, I like to shoot at the highest 5K resolution and at 30 frames per second. And I use 30 frames per second here for two reasons. The first being that when I'm trying to film cinematic style shots, I'm usually performing flowy turns and making gradual movements. And in these situations, the motion blur is not that extreme. Also, the goal here is to get footage that is more movie-like, so I wanna get as close as possible to that perfect 24 frames per second, but without risking my footage being too blurry. However, you can see that instead of using the standard 5.3K option, I chose 5K but with a four x three aspect ratio. All this does is produce a video that is the standard width, but has more detail in the top and bottom of the frame. I do this mostly because for my cinematic shots, I like to keep GoPro's internal stabilization, hyper smooth, turned off. And instead, I stabilize my footage using Real Steady Go. Real Steady Go is a third party software that gives a little bit more control when stabilizing your footage. And I personally like the floaty effect it gives to my final video. However, in order to stabilize your footage, Real Steady Go has to crop in your image a little bit, and the 4x3 aspect ratio gives it a lot more room to work with. This way, after it's done cropping your video, you will end up with a standard 16 by nine aspect ratio, which you're used to seeing. While if you start with a 16 by nine clip, sometimes you will end up with a shot that is cropped even further, uh, which what I think is 21 by nine. 
Now, I don't use Real Steady for freestyle because I find that it doesn't do as good of a job when maneuvers are extremely complex. Uh, in those situations, I do use Hyper Smooth. Uh, I find it to be more appealing. However, when you're bombing down a mountain or chasing an object and trying to get a cinematic looking shot, in my opinion, Real Steady wins by a long shot. Next, when it comes to the lens or width of my shot, instead of using Super View for my cinematic preset, I will almost always shoot using wide or even linear. Super View gives your image an extremely stylized fisheye look that GoPro is famous for. And although it looks pretty cool, the problem is that, well, it looks like a GoPro video. And if you look at FPV footage from someone like Johnny FPV or Nicholas Gayard or any other cinematic FPV pilots, Sometimes it's really hard to tell whether they filmed on a GoPro or a professional cinema camera. Now, part of this is post-production, and now a lot of it is shot on a better camera, but one of the best ways to hide the fact that you're shooting on a GoPro is to shoot on wide, and in some situations, even linear. This will get rid of that fisheye look and straighten out the horizon in your video. Now, I noticed that some of this lens distortion also gets fixed when I stabilize in Real Steady Go, but I like to leave as little as possible up to the software to fix, and I find that it works better if you do it ahead of time in the GoPro as well. Next, my shutter speed is set to 1 over 60, so that I'm following the 180 rule and doubling my frame rate. But here's where things get tricky. Although following the 180 rule and having a low shutter speed of 1 over 60 will give me that natural motion blur that I'm looking for, it also poses an issue. In almost all lighting situations, having a shutter speed of 1 over 60 would be considered very low, and will probably bring in way too much light into the camera, causing an overexposed image. Like I mentioned, this is why by default your GoPro will have the shutter speed set to auto. Normally the GoPro would prioritize exposing your image correctly, and it would do so by cranking up your shutter speed to let in less light, but now we're stopping it from doing so. And that's what these are for. This is an ND filter, and it pretty much acts as sunglasses for your camera. They simply attach to the front of your camera and limit the amount of light that can enter it. The brighter it is outside, the darker of an ND filter you would attach on the front until your exposure is regulated. This will give you the best of both worlds. It'll allow you to properly expose your image and will also allow you to continue following the 180 rule. I use these ones made by Polar Pro. I have no affiliation with them in any way, but I do think that they work really well. Uh, they also replace your original lens cover instead of stacking on top, so you don't have too many layers of glass over your lens. Uh, if you guys are interested, I'll leave a link to these down below. All right, getting back into it, next we have bitrate, which is also directly related to the quality of your video, and this should always be on high. Now, unless you are really worried about file size, having a high bitrate is helpful when you're uploading your video to YouTube or to another platform. A high bitrate will help counteract the compression that these social media platforms put on your videos uh, and will just make your upload look a little bit better. Next we have EV compensation. With this setting you would normally tell your GoPro what level of exposure you want it to achieve when all your settings are set to auto. But since we're setting things manually, this isn't something we have to worry about. I then set my minimum and maximum ISO to 100 to lock it in place. Now, most GoPros do a pretty good job at maintaining a clear image up to ISO 400. Anything higher than that will start to add too much grain into your video. Now, if you are flying in a location that has both really dark and really light areas, you might have no choice but to set your ISO max to 400 or even 800. And by giving your GoPro a range of ISOs, it will allow the camera to automatically brighten up when your image gets too dark so you can continue to see clearly as the lighting conditions change. But I try to lock it at 100 whenever possible because this gives me the most control over the exposure and it also makes color correction a lot easier. All right, white balance. In order to make sure that my white balance is always correct, I will make sure to adjust it before every flight. To make this easier, I added white balance as one of my home screen shortcuts which can also be adjusted in your preset settings. As a rough guide, 3200 Kelvin will match the color of indoor lights, 52 Kelvin being the color of daylight, and 6000 Kelvin commonly used for an overcast sky. So you'll wanna adjust your white balance based on your location. This will give you a little bit more control instead of leaving it all up to the GoPro to decide. 
Now, fun fact, I'm actually somewhat colorblind, so this is probably what I struggle with the most, but using those numbers that I gave you as a rough guideline definitely makes the process a lot easier. Next, my sharpness I set to low because I find that GoPro tends to add a lot of sharpening to every video. This again allows me to add as much sharpness as I want in post-production. Finally, I set the GoPro color to flat. Now, the flat color profile actually takes away some of the contrast and saturation in your image. Now, straight into the camera, this might look a little bit boring, but by doing so, your camera actually picks up more details in the shot. Again, it also allows you to have more control over how the final image will look with some editing and post-production. Uh, if you are someone who uses LUTs, uh, most LUTs will also add contrast back into your image, so they will actually look a lot better with a flatter color profile. Also, if you ever wanted to bring back your image to look like the standard GoPro colors, all you have to do is raise the contrast, raise the saturation, and you're good to go. You're back where you started. All right, and yeah, pretty sure that's it. Now, I know there's a lot of information to unpack in this video. Uh, you might have to watch it again to really take all of it in. Uh, hopefully I was clear with all of that, but I quickly wanna mention two more scenarios where I would make slight changes to these settings. First would be if I'm taking slow-mo shots. If I know I wanna slow down my footage, I would change my frame rate to 120 FPS meaning my shutter speed has to change to 1 over 240. To do this, the highest resolution I could use is 2.7K with the 4x3 aspect ratio. I also make two major changes when I'm flying freestyle. Now, I like to film freestyle with my lens set to super view. The really wide angle looks great. And instead of using Real Steady Go to stabilize, I'll use the internal stabilization Hyper Smooth. Now, to do this, the highest resolution I can use is 4K. And since Real Steady Go won't be cropping my image anymore, the classic 16 by nine version is okay. Anyways, remember, these are just my preferences and you might prefer something different. Feel free to copy these presets and use them for yourself, but it's always important to experiment and see what works for you. Also, these are all just general rules to follow, but none of them are set in stone. Just like with any art form with practice, you'll learn not only how to master these rules, but also when to break them. Now, I've currently been experimenting with actually breaking the 180 rule and working with different shutter speeds. It doesn't always work out, but there are situations where I've liked the results. So experiment, have fun, and thanks for watching this video. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.